Support for this episode of Judaism Unbound comes from the Oshman family JCC in Palo Alto, California, whose vision is to be the architects of the Jewish future. The Oshman family JCC is an incubator for new expressions of Jewish identity. It creates innovative Jewish learning, celebrations, and arts programs that inspire personal connections to people and ideas from across the Jewish world. Learn more at www.paloaltojcc.org. This is a special bonus edition of Judaism Unbound, The Orchard. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Lex Rofberg, and today we are doing a little bit of topsy-turvy, flipperoo, nonsense making because it's Purim. And on Purim, of course, you, you throw everything up in the air and it comes down different a little bit. Um, so we've switched the intro from Dan to me, and we've switched a few other elements of this episode. And uh, there's another reason for that, which is that today we're actually featuring our very own Dan Liebenson as a guest. So I don't know how one can simultaneously be host and guest, but today Dan is going to do a little bit of straddling of both positions. So. Dan Liebenson is the president and founder of the Institute for the Next Jewish Future. He's also the co-host of Judaism Unbound, a podcast that those of you listening probably have heard of. And uh, he's joining us today to talk about a different project related to these other ones, this book that he translated from Hebrew into English called The Orchard. And it was originally written by Yochi Brandis. Um, she's a terrifically talented writer in Hebrew. She doesn't speak English, though. That's why we are not interviewing her on our show. But we are featuring Dan because we know him pretty decently well at this point. And uh, we, we've got a lot to talk about and unpack with this book. But uh, before we do, Dan, welcome to the show. It's great to have you on. Yeah, thanks. It's really exciting to be on again. Absolutely. You're a, you're a second time guest and a hundred something time host. So, you know, that's pretty good. Probably among our highest, I would say. Also, before we dive in, uh, we're going to go ahead and be shameless and just say that if you want to go ahead and purchase the book for a limited time only, limited time only, woo, it's $2.99 digitally on Amazon. You can get the Kindle version that way. It's more than that for the paperback, but for a short time, you can get it for $2.99 on Amazon. Okay, so I guess uh, as we start off, just what is this book, The Orchard? What's its premise? What's going on? Why should folks be interested in reading it? Yeah, well, The Orchard is in a certain way the sequel, sort of, to the previous book by Yochi Brandis that I was involved in the translation of called The Secret Book of Kings. And Yochi Brandis has been one of Israel's best-selling and leading authors for quite a long time. Her focus was mostly writing about the lives of ultra-Orthodox women. But about 10 years ago or so, she turned her attention to writing about these key turning points in Jewish history and kind of uh, both, both through a feminist lens or a woman's eye lens and also highlighting some of the revolutions that have happened at these key turning points and so foregrounding that they were less evolutions than revolutions. And the first book, The Secret Book of Kings, was about the uh, beginning of the Judean and Israelite monarchies, the stories of David and Saul and the various kings of Israel. And this book is about the turning point that came after the destruction of the Second Temple with the dawn of rabbinic Judaism, which is something that we've talked a lot about uh, over the years on this show. And the book essentially tells the story of the early rabbis and the revolution that they brought about through the eyes of the wife of Rabbi Akiva, who was one of the leading people involved in the rabbinic revolution in the first and second centuries. Rabbi Akiva was in the second century. And, um, it, and another interesting piece is that the wife of Rabbi Akiva, whose name is Rachel, she gets most of her information from Rabbi Elisha ben Evuya, who is a great heretic in the Jewish tradition, or he's remembered that way. He's talked about in the Talmud as the other. Basically, he's sort of excommunicated from the Talmud as this terrible transgressor, as this person who basically abandons Judaism. But this this book tells the story of Elisha ben Avuya during the time that he was just another one of these a uh, group of, of early rabbis that were trying to figure out what Judaism was going to look like after the destruction of the temple version of Judaism. So that's fundamentally what the book is all about. And I'm really excited to finally be able to put it in people's hands. 
Yeah, um, and I got the chance to read it, which was very cool. You know, it's not often you get to read books before they come out. But um, one one piece I'd love to to explain for folks that's also uh, that might not be clear is so you've got this title, The Orchard, and that may sound familiar to some people who are familiar with the Talmud or familiar with this idea of what's in in Hebrew called the Pardes, which is sometimes translated as orchard, but also relates to some other things. And I'd love to hear from you. What's the deal with this orchard? Because I know it it relates to that Alicia Benabuya story that you just talked about and also to Akiva. Um, but what's what's going on with that title? Yeah, so there's this famous story in the Talmud that's kind of uh, obscure and nobody really knows exactly what it's all about, or I should say nobody knew until this book came out. But um, <laughs> but it was a, it's a story that talks about these four rabbis, uh, Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Elisha ben Avuya, the one that I talked about earlier, Ben Zoma and Ben Azai, and they go into a, quote, pardes. Now, a pardes, the technical definition is an orchard. It's also related to the words in, in Greek and I think Persian of paradise. Um, and so, you know, it's kind of an obscure exactly what it means. But these four rabbis go into this pardes and something happens to them, which is not clear what that is. And one of the rabbis goes insane. One of the rabbis dies. Elisha ben Avuya leaves Judaism, basically. And according to the story, only Rabbi Akiva emerged from the orchard or from the pardes intact. And the book fundamentally, ultimately explores what happened in that pardes, and also the question whether Rabbi Akiva really did come out intact. One of the features of this book that I think makes it really special, and also it was true of The Secret Book of Kings, is that she, Yochi Brandis, takes a variety of characters and stories from her texts. So in The Secret Book of Kings, it was the, the Book of Kings, or it was the Bible, and here it's the Talmud. And she takes the, and it's, I'm almost hesitant to call it like, entirely a work of just pure fiction. It's not that it's nonfiction, but she she finds little nuggets about characters and she weaves them in such that she's not just sort of choosing her own adventure with all these characters. She's not making them do whatever she wants them to. She's keeping them very much in tune with certain things they've said or stories they've been a part of. And it's a really powerful thing because it creates a kind of midrash. I mean, we've talked about the word midrash. It, it creates a kind of retelling of the story that is that feels like it could almost be true if you if you believe that the Talmud is true. I mean, there's plenty of ways it's not, but like it feels as true as that is is what I'm getting at. And so I'd love to hear from you um, as the person who was translating this and trying to get that across to readers who are probably less familiar as English speakers in the United States than many. Hebrew speakers in Israel with the Talmud, like how how did you go about doing that? And also, if you just want to comment on sort of what's powerful about that whole thing that she does, that would be great. For me, as someone who did grow up in an environment where I had a lot of education in the Talmud and the various rabbinic sources, it's weird because it's not that people in Israel or people who speak Hebrew are, are a lot more familiar with these folks than Americans are who don't speak Hebrew. I actually think that almost everyone is basically not all that familiar with the, the stories that this book covers. They've heard the stories, but they've tended to hear them as kind of snippets, as single stories that maybe have a little moral or maybe um, signify some important moment in the history of rabbinic Judaism or whatever. But I don't think that most people have ever had an experience educationally where all those stories have been woven together in a, into a single narrative. And what really struck me when I read the book for the first time in Hebrew was that all of these different rabbis that you might have seen their names in the Passover Haggadah, for example, in Pirkei Avot, that collection of sayings of the early sages, you, you've seen some of these names, but you kind of forget them from one reading to the next. You know, they have a lot of them have similar sounding names and you kind of don't, at least I never fully 
uh, connected the fact that Rabbi Eliezer says this over here and he says that over there and that that's actually consistent with his character. I think that my experience in reading this book was that you come to see these rabbis as characters, you know, and you understand that the various things that they do across these different stories actually are consistent. And so I think that actually someone who reads this book in many ways, they actually end up substantially more advanced in their understanding of who these rabbis were and what their agendas were at the early dawn of rabbinic Judaism than the vast majority of people who've actually grown up within the more traditional realms of Judaism today. By the way, Dan, what, what thing we didn't say before, like Habarde Shalakiva, the Israeli version of this, it was a really highly selling book in Israel, right? Yeah, huge bestseller in Israel. Got Yeah, I, I was fairly sure of that, but I just wanted to make sure that people were aware that this is, I mean, this is a book that in terms of like cultural corpus, a lot of people in Israel have been familiar with. And I've even spoken to some Hebrew speaker friends of mine in, in the States that have read the, the Hebrew version. Um, yeah. And actually there's this, there's this phenomenon that's been going on in Israel for the last 10 or 15 years where secular Israelis have taken an interest in studying some of the textual sources of the Jewish tradition, namely the Bible and the Talmud or the work of the rabbis. But it's not that they're studying it in order to become more religious. They're studying it sort of to ground themselves in a textual and cultural foundation that they can then build on today in secular ways. And so The Orchard and The Secret Book of Kings, when they came out in Israel, they I think very much rode and also drove the cultural zeitgeist in Israel today about saying, can we remine our tradition in order to uh, find new ideas that that we can use today to sort of build a, a, a more robust culture and, and hopefully also a, a more just culture? Let's pivot to the narrator of this story. Um, Rachel, who you mentioned, I mean, you, you you talked about this a little bit, that Rachel being the narrator provides a really important take on this set of stories. And also, I mean, we talked about this when we when we spoke about the, the Secret Book of Kings, that there are female narrators involved there that play a really important role. And so I guess I'd love to hear what about that adds a particular flavor to this book. I, I, I really wish that Yolki Brandis herself could could speak to this because I know it's an important part of how she writes. But like, how does that shift this book away from maybe other books that people have seen out there related to the early rabbis? Yeah, I really wish that Yolki Brandis could be on to speak about that too, because obviously this is her passion and, and this is her special skill. I, I think she's able to give voice to women who have been voiceless through much of Jewish text. Um, in the Talmudic tradition, there really are very few women that have well-developed characters. And uh, two of the ones that are most richly drawn in the Talmud uh, are featured in this book. One is Rachel, the wife of Rabbi Akiva, and the other is Bruria, who was the wife of Rabbi Meir, and um, is a character in the Talmud in her own right. I think that the Talmud and the Jewish tradition being written by men often places women in this kind of supportive position. And so, you know, at best, the praise goes to a woman who's been really supportive of her man. And actually, in a lot of ways, that's the way the story of Rachel has been told throughout most of the history of Jewish textual interpretation. So basically the story, which is quite famous in the traditional Jewish world of Rabbi Kiva and Rachel, is that Rabbi Kiva was this 40-year-old uneducated shepherd, the son of converts who was illiterate. And somehow Rachel, uh, who was the daughter of a very, very wealthy man, noticed him and understood that he could be a great rabbi and basically insisted that he go and study and become a rabbi and that she kind of um, held down the fort. She married him and, and held down the fort at home uh, while he went off and studied and she kind of took care of, of everything and enabled him to study. And this, the way the story is told is like, what a wonderful woman she was that she supported her man in doing this, who ultimately became the great Rabbi Akiva, one of the founders of rabbinic Judaism. 
the the novel looks at that story and draws what in retrospect is sort of the the most obvious conclusion that you could imagine from the story that Rabbi Akiva studied for many many years different different ways of telling the story uh, have different lengths of time but either way it was a, a very long period of time and the natural conclusion I think if you're a woman and you're reading this story is like well Basically, she was abandoned by her husband for this whole period of time. And what Yochi Brandis sort of brilliantly does in telling the story of Rachel is that she introduces us to the concept of the aguna, which is the idea that a woman is abandoned by her husband, but he is not known to be dead. And therefore, she is in this kind of middle place between being married and unmarried, and so she's not able to marry any other person, but she's also, she doesn't even know if her husband is still alive or she's, or she knows that he's alive, but he's abandoned her and refused to give her a divorce. And so she's in this terrible situation. This is a situation that uh, still exists today in the, in certain parts of the traditional um, Orthodox world where a husband refuses to give his wife a Jewish divorce. And she's basically in this terrible position of being an aguna. Um, and, and I think it's a brilliant sort of narrative approach for Yochi Brandis to understand that there's a way of understanding the story that we've learned, if we've learned it, as this great story of heroism, both the heroism of Rabbi Akiva to study and become a rabbi and, and everything that he did afterwards, and the heroism of his wife to enable this, uh, but rather that the same story sort of lends itself to a, a different point of view where essentially the wife who starts out by wanting to see this man become who he's destined to be ends up suffering terribly and holding the the, the responsibility and, and, and the harms for enabling that. And it's not so much that this book has a different take necessarily on the experience of women. It's just that the Talmud has no take really on the experiences of women. And so I think it's, you know, shouldn't be, but it's actually quite a revolutionary act to look at the stories of the dawn of rabbinic Judaism and to even provide a woman's perspective. And and frankly, I, I think that, that just that very fact is a indication from my perspective as to why it's so important to reopen the question of the form of Judaism, because a, a Judaism that was created in an environment that really didn't take seriously the experiences of women and didn't really have an opinion one way or the other about what the women must have been experiencing may not be a Judaism that's structured to do the work that we needed to do today. So another theme of this book that I'm going to try to get into without doing spoilers, which is going to be a challenge, and I think it'll be a challenge for both of us, but um, it relates very directly, I think, maybe more than anything else, to our podcast and our lens that you've alluded to here and there of sort of revisioning and redefining what it means what Judaism means now and in the future. And it relates to how various characters, including Akiva, engage with what we might term Jewish tradition or specifically with Jewish texts. And there's an ongoing conflict, once again, without going into it too specifically, there's an ongoing conflict between various folks about how we should engage with text and how we should apply traditions of text to the present moment, to the future. I'd love to hear from you as best as you can without spoilers what what that was like to translate because I know there are some challenges in in translating some of those textual pieces from Hebrew to English but also sort of the ramifications of that conversation about past tradition and precedent and change over time. Well, in the tradition Rabbi Akiva is is very clearly introduced to us as this as I said earlier as this man who who was illiterate until the age of 40 and who came from parents who had converted to Judaism and what the novel does that I, that I think you know it seems so obvious and right when you think about it is that it introduces Rabbi Kiva or introduces 
Akiva initially as a person with an incredibly creative mind, right? Just a person who, like we've talked about a lot on the podcast, who I've been calling an artist, right? Somebody who's just a, an extremely creative person. He's still illiterate, but he's got the, the makings of it. As he learns Jewish content, he just naturally doesn't read it the same way everybody else reads it. Folks are conditioned to think that if they haven't had a great Jewish education, they're somehow in an inferior position to be a Jewish leader or a creative Jewish thinker or whatever. And what I think is, is really remarkable about the book is that it, it, uh, there's a line in the book that basically Rachel says to Akiva that only because you learn to read at the age of 40, are you able to read the text the way that you do? You know, if you had learned to read when they all did, you would read like they all do. Something like that is the line that she she has. Um, and the challenge is in the translation, how do you uh, translate something that uh, much of which comes from wordplay, right? I mean, the reason why Akiva is able to be so creative with the text is that often in Hebrew, the uh, when when words uh, the vowels are indicated through dots under the letters, and so the letters in Hebrew words are all consonants, and so uh, you're often able to have two words that um, have the same consonants but different vowels, and they might mean something very different. So, for example, the word chalav means milk, but the word chalav means fat where you, you could imagine that in a certain sentence it said you should do X, Y, and Z about milk, you know, Akiva can read that sentence and say you should do X, Y, and Z about fat. But that would be totally not seen by the English reader who is, um, you know, doesn't, doesn't see any relation between milk and fat in English. So, you know, they're, they're, um, it, it was really interesting. And it was interesting having sort of the back and forth with Yochi. For example, um, there, there's a, a famous line, uh, right, that in both actually the, the New Testament and the Old Testament, that you should love your neighbor as yourself. Now, in Hebrew, the phrase uh, for your neighbor is reacha. And the the word that would mean your spouse is rayatcha. So I don't know if you can exactly hear that in the podcast, but they're very, very close. And so a wordplay could could uh, read that line, you should love your neighbor as yourself. You could kind of read it with just a small variation, you should love your spouse as yourself. And it was a really critical piece in the story to, to, be, to allow Akiva to have that wordplay and so, you know, I had him read it as you should love your favored as yourself, because at least favored and neighbor sort of rhyme. And so you get some sense of the wordplay, even though it's actually a, a sort of a different wordplay than, than you have in the Hebrew. That's a tough decision for a translator to make, because in a certain way, you're, you're not actually translating the, the book uh, exactly, you know, from the original. But, you know, I felt and, and ultimately uh, Yochi agreed that it was important to capture the essence of what Akiva is doing, which is finding creative ways to read these texts that would seem to require Judaism to be a certain way, but he finds a way to read them in order to permit Judaism to go a different way. And, you know, again, I, I keep saying this, but I, I think that um, for the reader of this novel, the important thing is not to, and not in my view, to pick up on the uh, wordplay of the Hebrew letters, but to understand the interpretive moves that we make often in Judaism and that are made in, in all kinds of realms of life. You know, I'm a lawyer and the same thing happens in the American legal tradition, that you find all these kind of ways to say, well, we are making a nod to the tradition. We are making a nod to the original text, but at the same time, we have to embrace the fact that we are empowered to deviate from it when we feel we need to. And a clever and I think cute and and respectful way to do that is to find a way to um, cite the text, but to find a, a different way to, to twist it so that it, it permits this thing that we feel that we need to be doing. I'm going to go on a little... Uh, it's not a tangent. It's it's a response because I just my positive excitement put buttons get pushed when we talk about interpretation and translation, which is part of why I asked you about it. Um, 
But when I was in college and I wrote my thesis, a lot of what I wrote about, I've mentioned in the past that it was about Kol Nidre. And that's only half true because it, it was about Kol Nidre, this prayer on uh, this declaration on Yom Kippur, many people are familiar with that's seen as sort of a big ticket moment in the Jewish calendar year. But it wasn't really about that. It was about how different prayer books translated it. And, and what they juxtaposed it with in terms of related readings and historical notes and all this stuff. And, and what was so important for me to internalize at the beginning of writing this, this thesis was that every translation is interpretation. And every interpretation is, in a sense, translation. Like, th there's no such thing, really, as perfectly taking one language and rendering it in another language in a way that is unchanged and, and exactly reflects what the original was. One could look at that and be sort of fatalistic about it and sort of say, well, every translator screwed and can never do their job effectively. But what you just got at with how you played with favored and favored and neighbor instead of you could have said, well, I can't get I can't get the wordplay. So I'm just going to have to say love your neighbor as yourself and love your spouse as yourself and like put a footnote that says yo in hebrew those are a word play that would be that would be cool to you if if you were in the like you didn't do that um and there's an argument that that would have been more quote unquote faithful but what you did was you i mean i, I don't want to speak for you but you made a decision that the the words of the text here were not actually the primary point the the word play was the point. And so it was more important to convey the word play than it was to convey the words. And we've actually spoken to that a million times because you've talked about how, you know, the blessing before the Torah, it, it, like people, people won't let you say it a certain way because, it, or they won't let certain people say it because it says, Asher Bacharbanu, which in Hebrew is who chose us. It's talking about Jews being chosen. So like, how could somebody who's not Jewish participate in that blessing before the Torah? And what you've said before, which I, which spoke to me in such a deep way is what if it doesn't actually mean that? What if it just means we're about to read the Torah? Because most people in the room are hearing it that way. And it's actually sort of, it's a, it's a very different context here. We're talking about wordplay versus sort of ritual. But what we see is that Every, every phrase, every word, every text is not just the content literally of the words in the text, but is actually far broader and can convey emotions, can, can convey rhymes, can convey feelings, can convey all sorts of things. That's actually, in a weird way, sort of a theme of this book, I think, because, because interpretation is such a confrontational key piece that drives all the character development of the rabbis involved. So I don't know what my question is. I'm, I'm going to pretend that this was a question because mostly this was my excuse to talk for a while. But like, how does that resonate? I forget if I mentioned this before too, but I mean, one of the most striking things about translation that I've ever read was uh, in this book called And God Said, which is a book about the process of translating the Bible by a translator named Joel Hoffman. And he talks about the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, etc. Uh, and he talks about how uh, the Lord is my shepherd is technically the right translation for the Hebrew, which is uh, got, which is Roe, my shepherd. Um, but he says, like, those of us in the 21st century think about shepherds as these kind of kids who walk around with, with goats and sheep. And it's kind of this like pastoral quiet type of thing. But back then, when this was written, a shepherd was basically a hero who defended the flock from mountain lions. And so the idea that the Lord is my shepherd is not the Lord is this nice guy who's walking around with me in a quiet way, but rather the Lord is this hero who's defending me from from being attacked. And so, you know, he says it would be more effective to get the point to translate that as the Lord is my lumberjack, because then we would really have the image <laughs> that that is trying to get at. But he says there, you know, you can't really translate it as the Lord is my lumberjack because it's clearly not a lumberjack. It's clearly a shepherd, you know, so so he he kind of felt like. If I'm recalling correctly, but somebody could. You I mean, could. You could. He, right? he, somebody could. Somebody could. But you know, he. I think he said like he threw up his hands on that one. If I'm recalling correctly, and said, you know, it's just you have to write a footnote. Here, I, I just really didn't feel like I had that 
that ability, right? You can't have a you you could, but it wouldn't be very great to have footnotes in novels, you know. And so, um, so I felt like you had to have dialogue that made sense to the reader, you know. That that feels like the number one um, responsibility of someone who's creating art is that it. And and you know, I, I'm not the creator of the art of the story, but I'm still the creator of the art of the experience of the story for people who are reading in English. And so you kind of feel like I got to do this in a way that's going to feel real to the reader. That's number one. And then number two is how do I do that in a way that captures the essence of what this the original author is trying to achieve here? And there's got to be a way. So are there any other elements of the translation process um, or discoveries that you made about translation or language throughout this process that would be helpful for us to wrestle with and put out there? You know, I think that in a in a more profound way, um, it it brings to mind something that you and I have discussed a lot, which is the role of Hebrew in the discourse of American Judaism. You know, and I, and I think that there's a lot of people who think that the that various debates that we might have or various new things that we might create in American Judaism are somehow impoverished if they don't. Um, if the people don't have access to Hebrew, and if the and if they're if the people aren't learning Hebrew, and it's funny because you would think that as a translator and as a fluent Hebrew speaker, right. I would agree with yeah. that. But actually, yeah. I kind of feel like my role is to make it not necessary for that to be the case for everybody else. You know, I feel very fortunate, and I feel, um, you know, I'm I'm glad that I speak Hebrew. But I actually feel that it's not necessary to speak Hebrew in order to be a Jewish creative force. Um, I do think that if one doesn't speak Hebrew, they're going to be missing access to certain types of materials. But then I feel like that's where the responsibility of those of us who can access and translate those materials is, is, really, is really valuable. And um, it's something that, that we should have more of. And by the way, it's not only from Hebrew to English. I, I feel like um, for me, uh, I don't know if, I, if it's some kind of, you know, diagnosable condition or whatever, but like I'm finding it very hard these days to read a book in print. So I'm so grateful when there are audiobooks available for books that I want to read. Now, a lot of times I have a conversation with somebody where I say, I read this book and they say, oh, did you really read it? You know, no, you listen to the audio book. And I'm like, well, it's not a competition. You know, like I, <laughs> I took in the information, you know, I enjoyed the experience. I thought a lot about it. Like, why is it more laudable to read it in print than to listen to the audio book? And you know, they would say, oh, well, you're, you're missing certain aspects of the experience. It's harder to dwell on, on certain sentences. It's harder to appreciate the, the literary construction of language, all of which I agree with. But there are also benefits to getting it in the form of an audiobook. Now, with a translation, it's really interesting because whoever doesn't speak Hebrew and hasn't listened to this podcast and reads the book, right, is going to think that in some way the, the, the genius of Akiva was, in that particular case that we talked about, the genius of Akiva was something about rhyming, you know, as opposed to what his, you know, historical genius really was, which was more about kind of wordplay that had to do with changing the, the way that the vowels would be read um, or, you know, inserting a letter or whatever. And my question is, is that really the most important thing? Is that what Akiva's genius was? Or is Akiva's genius that he took this kind of free, you know, freewheeling um, interpretive approach to the original source material that he had, which in this case was a Hebrew text, but in another case could easily be an English text or, you know, a longstanding oral tradition of how we interpreted text or how or have anything to do with text about things that we've done over the centuries with Judaism. You know, whatever your source material is, that your genius is to take it and take it seriously, respect it, and then put your spin on it to me, it doesn't doesn't matter that it's that the, that the reader understands exactly what that spin was. We're not here. To, the book is not about a celebration of Rabbi Akiva. I think the book is about uh, understanding in a deep way 
the revolution that the beginnings of rabbinic Judaism represented when compared to the Judaism that had come before, and that fundamentally it, it, it ought to empower us to feel that same freedom combined with responsibility. And so therefore, the most important thing for me to do as a translator is to make sure that the reader has that experience rather than to be you know, completely um, tied to what he actually did in the story. I'm whirling in my head about like, what would it look like if we took some of the mechanisms that are traditional in the Hebrew language for mid, for like changing the vowels, like you talked about, and like applied it to English or to other languages. I'm like, I feel like that would be a really important service to the world. And like, I think there are actually people that have started to do this, but they think it's like cutesy. Um, and, and I don't know that they view it as like a deep rich thing. I, I'm thinking of rabbis or even non-rabbis who there's there's the blessing over the study of Torah and it ends with la asok bedivrei Torah, which in Hebrew s- loosely means like, think, so it starts with the same preface, baruch atah, like blessed are you God, blah, 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 who like allows us to busy ourselves in Torah, like some something like that. But la asok in English sounds like soak. Hmm. And and so I've heard people, maybe it's a renewal thing, but I, th- I think I've heard it in another context too. I've heard people say, like, blessed are you, blah, 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 God, who who causes us to soak in Torah, which for me is so beautiful and is exactly what I'm trying to do when I'm studying Torah, I, what I'm, when I'm reading this text, honestly, like Yochi Brandis's text. Um, and and it's, it's like a window into... A, a future that could exist if we looked at English as possessing that same potential for sort of, I don't know, midrashic value that we see in Hebrew. Because I because it's not that it's not there. I think there are strengths of the Hebrew language built on its roots, et cetera, et cetera, that like make it easy. But we could figure out those same things in other languages, and we we absolutely should. I would say that the example that you just used, the the idea of connecting la'asok in Hebrew and soak in English is exactly what Akiva was doing back then, right? The negative reaction that people have to that idea, they say, oh, how could you take an English word and connect it to a Hebrew root? They have nothing in common with each other. That was exactly the reaction that his contemporaries had to what Akiva was doing. Now, the things that Akiva was doing of connecting things based on wordplay, now we take that for granted in Rabbinic Judaism because Rabbinic Judaism ultimately was built out of that. Akiva is the you know one of the major founders of Rabbinic Judaism. In fact, there's this... Uh, amazing story in the Talmud uh, in which Moses goes up to Mount Sinai to receive the, the Ten Commandments or the Torah. And, you know, basically God is taking forever to to write the Torah and he's making all these little crowns on top of the letters, you know, and Moses says, what's what are you doing? And basically God says, you know, I'm putting these crowns on top of the letters because there's this guy, Akiva, that's going to come in, in a long time from now and he's going to make all kinds of interpretive meaning out of the crowns of the letters. Right now, that's exactly the kind of thing that at his time, the people were saying to Akiva, what are you doing making meaning out of these crowns of the letters? Like, those are just decorative yeah. flourishes, you know, and, and but but he he won that argument. And rabbinic Judaism came to say, yeah, of course, we can make um, meaning out of the the symbolic dimensions of the letters and of all kinds of other little hints. So so the idea that it's kind of somehow not kosher to make some kind of connection between uh, uh, an English rhyme to a Hebrew word, you know, that's only because that's where we are in history. And and so that's the part that I, I just wish people could really take in. It's like, why is it that the only legitimate approaches are those approaches that, you know, people came up with in their time for their particular reasons uh, 2000 years ago? You know, there's all kinds of um, interpretations that are made because of similarities between Hebrew and Aramaic words. So why wouldn't that be equally true today? You know, it's just it's just sort of mind boggling. This is maybe a ridiculous thought, but maybe not. Like, what if what if somebody proposed that every translation of the Torah should be in a serif font? Um not a sans serif font. Um, for those who have serif fonts, are they, they have like the little line. I, it's hard to, to describe this visually, but you've all seen them. It's the difference between letters on uh, on a screen or on a page that have the little lines below them, like um, versus those are sort of smoother. Um, 
And we've all seen the serifs a million times. Times New Roman, the default font for a long time was a serif font. Now the now the font in Microsoft Word is Calibri, which is not serif. I'm I'm rambling, but like, what if we required there to be serifs on on Torah translation? I mean, you and I aren't really for requiring that much of anything <laughs> with Jewish stuff, but like like if somebody said, you know, we should have serifs because there's this whole teaching about the crowns of the letters, and we don't have crowns in the way we write English so much, but we do have serifs. And like somebody should come along and say, well, the serif on the letter P in this word is getting at this. And the way that Rabbi Akiva would come along and say the crown on this letter, like I'd, the, the possibilities, even just as we're starting this conversation, are so clearly endless for where this could go if we believe that that is, once again, not just like cutesy, oh, that's cool, but actually like a real interpretive mechanism and i like yeah i thought you were going to take it even in another direction which is that like the seraphim you know were these um you know angels uh kind of things and and so of course the torah should be written with the seraphs i did not think of that i've (laughs) I've got to up my interlingual pun game um but that's yeah that's a great but like if we if we gave ourselves the permission because we have to give it to ourselves nobody's going to give it to us um if if we if we gave ourselves that permission uh, I, I strongly believe that all the English speakers I know in English could do astounding, incredible things. And some already are. I shouldn't make it. Uh, there are lots of other soak, la soak things out there. I shouldn't pretend there's none, but like we could have more and then we could have people in other languages and it could, and it could create this culture whereby the Jewish thing isn't, wow, look at Hebrew. And there are these great roosts and midrash, but actually the, the thing that we do Jewishly is that we make these incredible interpretive finds and discoveries in whatever language. Exactly. I mean, it's, and, 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 you know, it's funny because it almost feels like people expect, it's said so often that people assume that right, Hebrew is this remarkable language for all of the, these, this, you know, these ways that you can interpret it in all kinds of ways. And like, that's not, that's not true, but it's also true that every other language is, you know, and, and that the interlinguistic, moves like that are probably even more incredible. No, I think that's huge. Um, okay, so just we're we're rounding out, but are there are there other elements either of the experience of translation, but also we've been on that for a while, like of of the story itself that we can give listeners sort of a taste of as they hopefully head over to Amazon or wherever and press that purchase link. If you want to think about and know the most that you can about the Judaism of the past 2,000 years, rabbinic Judaism, I don't think you can do better than this book for a lay person's introduction. You you really get, first of all, a great story, a number of great stories, and you will really come to know these characters as characters. I mean, my experience of... Uh, this period, the first and second centuries, has been utterly transformed by my reading of this book, because all of these people who for me were just names on a page, and for others aren't even that, they would have never heard of these people, but you come out of the book with an absolute understanding of the characters of these people, Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Joshua, Rabbi Gamliel, um, and you, you will never look at the Talmud or those kind of stories or rabbinic Judaism, you'll never look at it the same way again, because you feel like you were there at its origin and you knew the people who created it and you knew what motivated them and you knew what they cared about and you knew about their rivalries and things that we may have heard of, like the rivalries between the school of Hillel and the school of Shammai, like you get that on a much deeper level. And so you don't need to come into this book with any pre-existing knowledge of rabbinic Judaism or of Judaism, uh, but rather you can, you, if you do come in with that knowledge, I think you'll get a tremendous amount out of this book in terms of adding to that. I mean, I came into this with a lot of knowledge and I came out of it with 10 times as much knowledge and deeper understanding. But if you come into it with no knowledge, I think you'll come out of it with a really deep foundation and understanding of what was going on at the origins of rabbinic Judaism. And I think it would be an incredible platform 
to build on in terms of wanting to learn more. And there are various kinds of audio courses that are available, like on Audible, there's some audio courses on the origins of Judaism and all kinds of other stuff that's out there that I think you'll really understand much, much better having read this novel. And it's also a really enjoyable experience. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I also came into this book having some level of familiarity with the various people featured in it. But what struck me is that she manages to do that for, I don't know, a dozen, a couple dozen characters without any of them being the clear hero or antagonist. Spoiler alert, a little bit, but not really. Like, none of them is the villain. Like, they all are relatable, and you come to understand and feel for the perspectives of everybody here. And yet it's still a compelling story. It's very hard to do that. Like, if you don't have a big drama of good against evil in a straightforward way, that's the formula for most successful fiction, I think. But the fact that you're able to connect in a deep way to these various folks and see them all as like flawed and also fantastic to the point where you you see them in that you know text study or in the prayer book a few weeks later and it resonates so deeply for you it, it's a special thing that she's put together i mean i want to just keep raving about this book because it's really spectacular all of you please read it send us your thoughts about it send us your questions send us whatever um it would be awesome but uh just dan liebenson thank you so much for joining us on this episode and giving us the behind the scenes translator's view Thanks so much for having me. And uh, on this Purim day of reversals, I'm going to do the closing. The first thing I want to mention is that The Orchard is available at Amazon for a limited time, we believe, for a low $2.99 price on Kindle. So if you want to read the book, you should go and download it today because I don't know how much longer that price is going to be there. So it's $2.99 as we speak on Kindle. And there's also a paperback available. It's not coming out in hardcover because that's the way in Israel, I guess. And <laughs> um, and and so uh, we want to really thank you for listening today. We want to close out, as we always do, by asking you to be in touch with us. And there's a few ways that you can do that. One is through our Facebook page, Judaism Unbound. Another is through our website, judaismunbound.com. And you can also email us at dan at judaismunbound.com or lex at judaismunbound.com. We love hearing from listeners. And we are also now on Twitter. I know very little about this, but I'm going to learn. And uh, apparently you can follow us at at Judaism Unbound. And we're going to be getting our sea legs on Twitter going. And finally, we like to ask you to consider making a donation. You can make a one-time donation of anywhere from $18 to $18 million. And you can also make a small recurring monthly donation or a large recurring monthly donation. The best way to see the various ways that you can make a donation is to go to our website at www.judaismunbound.com donate. So thank you so much for listening. And with that, this has been Judaism Unbound.